Okay, awesome. Um, so this morning, we're very um, happy to welcome Jamie and Erica from the Evolve Giving Group. Um, we are very glad that they were willing to partner with us on this presentation. Um, Evolve Giving Group, and they'll give you a little bit more of their background, but because there's, they're a full service fundraising and nonprofit management firm um, and have lots of great experience, we thought it would be a great partnership for the center. Um, Jamie is the executive director, executive vice president at Evolve and a seasoned nonprofit professional with over 20 years of experience, uh, specifically securing very large gifts for um, several large nonprofit organizations. She's also an active volunteer serving on several nonprofit boards. Um, Erica serves as the senior associate consultant with nearly 15 years of fundraising experience. She's managed all facets of fundraising from annual funds to special events and she also consults with nonprofits about board governance and is an active volunteer and board members are herself. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Jamie I believe is going to take the reins here <laughs> and lead us in the next uh, next part of this presentation. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And I really appreciate Dr. Shadman that very nice introduction. We're excited to be here with you this morning. And we are also really excited because um, less important than us, or less important than, than Eric and I are the amazing three clients that we've asked to join us today because really um, we, they have so much to share and we have so much that we can learn from them. Um, a little bit more about Evolve is we are a woman founded and managed consulting firm. We do a lot of work here in Chicago. We're based in Chicago. And actually we have all been working out of our home offices for years. So unlike many of you, this has not been a new situation for us. What's been new is that uh, our spouses and partners and children are home with us. So uh, that's been new for us. Uh, but all of our consultants have worked in house at and most of us in fundraising, but a lot of us also in nonprofit management and program areas. So what I love about working here is that we all really understand the business from the ground up and we understand what it's like to be in your shoes. And I, the other thing that makes me really proud of Evolve is that we really are very hands-on collaborative. Most of our clients are small to mid-sized nonprofits. So we really can get in the weeds with you and, and help a lot from a very tactical level as well as a strategic one. So thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning and I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Erica. Hi, thank you. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Dr. Shapman. And I also um, just wanna say that we're so happy to have you all here today. We have allotted some time for Q and A at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions anytime along the way in the chat box or via the Q&A. Jamie is going to be monitoring that and um, helping to make sure that your questions get answered throughout. And as uh, Dr. Shapman said, we're also gonna be sharing the recording, the slides and the bios and emails of our speakers that will all be on our website under our COVID section, which has a lot of free resources for all of you during this time. Um, I wanted to start, Dr. Shapman, are we able to do um, a little temperature taking and to, and to see who's in the room by sending out those polls. Is that Yes, doable? yeah. Awesome. So let me go ahead and I'll launch one that's about uh, background first. So check all that apply, um, nonprofit staff, board member, volunteer, consultant, NIU student or other. And I'll, I'll share it, let's see here. I'll share it when we get up to about 70%. We're about 60% have voted so far. Oh, it's a real mix. You guys will, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Wow. Okay. Cool. So let me go ahead and share. There you go. Great. Awesome. And then I think we also had another where we kind of want to Get a sense of um, if you are working in the sector, what area within the sector you're working in. Yep, there you go. We have about 15% have voted so far. So once it gets up to around 70, I'll share it so you guys can see. Again, it's also a mix, um, which is good. And if you're a student and you're interested in a specific area, you can still answer this. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, Very let me cool. go ahead and share it with you. There you go. Great. And one more just for fun, right? We have <laughs> just <one>. for fun. <laughs> this, is, this is extra important. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> Dog person, cat person, or neither. <laughs> Oh, there's a clear winner here. Maybe you guys can guess. Oh, wow. <laughs> I shut the door so that my cat can't come in here, and now I'm happy. Because here you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for doing that, Dr. Jamin. Yep. Um, and Jamie is going to be the one right now to kind of kick us off to introduce our terrific panelists today. Yeah, great. So, um, I had the pleasure of working with all three of our panelists uh, in a really hands-on way. So let me first introduce to you Julio, who is the Chief uh, Development Officer at Chicago Commons. So uh, Evolve was hired by Chicago Commons to do a fundraising assessment and a help to uh, build out a plan. And one of the things that we recommended is that they really needed a C-level development person brought on. And right kind of toward the end of our engagement, they hired Julio. And so since then, we've built a great relationship. And it's, it's been so much fun to see the fundraising operation there just really thrive so much under your leadership, Julio. Uh, but Chicago Commons is an amazing organization. They are a little more than 125 years old. They have, they were originally a settlement house in the city and they served uh, a lot. It, they've always been kind of really ingrained in the communities and they have programs that serve children, adults, seniors. And part of the reason we asked Julio to join us today is here in this pandemic, they really have had to kind of rethink so much of how they work in order to continue to provide services uh, in the community. So Julio, thank you for joining us and we're excited to learn from you today. Um, Jamie Lake, I mean, first of all, I love her name. Uh, second of all, Jamie and I have worked together now, I think for about two years. Uh, Keshet is an organization that's based on the, in the north suburbs of Chicago, and they serve over a thousand people with disabilities and special needs. Again, very much have been affected. Their work has been so affected by this pandemic in they've had to pivot so many of their programs. And Jamie is also the chief development officer there. Uh, it's been really amazing to be their partner for almost the last three years and see how they've really changed and grown. And it's, they just completed a really amazing campaign uh, in the midst of a pandemic. And we are just like so amazed by how well they were able to do that. And so Jamie, thank you for joining us today. And then finally, Laura, who I have known the longest of this group, Laura has been working with us on and off for many, many years. She is the executive director of an organization called the Lake County Haven, uh, and they serve homeless women and children. And Laura has been their leader for many years, has led them through so many uh, wonderful times, so many challenging times. This, this pandemic really uh, they've, they've, they've kept their homes open. They've really been taking care of people yeah, in an amazing way throughout this time. And, and Laura also is, and she won't admit to this, she's an amazing fundraiser. And she led a capital campaign uh, that, that launched a new, a new resident. So it's, it's really been fun to be a part of, of their success and to get to know Laura over the years. So thank you, Laura, for joining us. Thank you so much, Jamie. So now that you've all been introduced to the panelists, I wanna officially get this webinar party started. I think it's really important to provide a little context since I know we are all in the thick of this pandemic. Uh, independent sector conducted a study on the impact of COVID-19 on large and mid-sized nonprofits. And they found that 83% of organizations experienced a reduction in revenue 71% have responded with a reduction in services or available operations. A total of 47% reduction in nonprofit jobs was reported when comparing April 2020 to previous years. And 67% have furloughed employees since the start of COVID-19. 
Additionally, 51% have unfortunately had to lay off employees since the start of COVID-19, and 53% of organizations have had a reduction in individual giving. And when asked what types of assistance would then be most helpful during this tough time, 92% suggested additional loan options, such as forgivable loans. So while all of this is really tough to hear, rest assured there is so much hope. We as a nonprofit sector are incredibly resilient. And today Evolve is so happy to be partnering with Northern Illinois University's Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies to conduct this webinar featuring those amazing nonprofit leaders that you just heard about who are going to speak with you about what their organizations did and continue to do to pave the path forward and pivot during this pandemic. So let's begin by talking a little bit about the backbone of organizations, the operational functions. So when we talk about operations, whoops, sorry about that. When we talk about operations, we really want to look at, you know, a bunch of different pieces, whether that's technology, staffing, remote or safe management and budget. So starting off, Jamie Lake, Cash should often rent space for your programs. What does that partnership look like during this time? What did you do to continue to ensure the safety of your partnerships and your participants? Uh, thanks, Erica. So I think the reason that we rent space, and I don't know if rent is always quite the right word, part of our business model is to not be in the real estate business. So to not own property, if we can avoid it, um, to keep overhead down. So often what we do is have space in other buildings, some of which we contributed financially to when they were building the space, others it's more of a, a rent model. And that's particularly true in our schools. So we run schools, but they're all, they all take place in some other school where uh, we have a wing or classrooms or space set up specifically for us. And so it was an interesting thing. I think for us in the start of all this in March, we closed our programs before any of our host sites did or closed our in-person programs. Um, so they ended up following for us the model of how we communicated and did that. But as time has gone on and we've had, we've slowly reopened, it's been, you know, the, uh, a positive, it's been good and challenging um, because we are also, you know, in terms of wanting to do things safely and doing them to a standard that we hold, we are also um, have to abide by the policies and rules and the spaces that we're in. And so I think a, a, an interesting point of that is we have space in four different schools. We only have students in person at three because the fourth school um, or fourth location hasn't come out with a clear enough statement for us yet to feel comfortable sending our staff back into that space. So they're actually doing everything remote. Um, but all in all, I think for us, you know, when you begin to go into a financial issue or concerned about how you're going to proceed, it's a relief not to know that you don't have to worry about space um, and how you're going to keep, you know, managing a, a real estate portfolio that way. Um, but all, you know, I think it's been it's been helpful to have also other people that we can throw our ideas to. These are other excellent school providers um, and also excellent program providers, and able to compare notes with them and um, learn from each other has been very helpful. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Julio. You know, what have operations looked like at Chicago Commons since the pandemic? Talk to us a little bit about staffing changes or additions during this time, because I know. You're kind of a unique um, situation where you were able to even add some staff during this time. That's right. And first of all, thank you, Erica, Jamie, and um, Dr. Alicia for having us and kudos to my co-panelists. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we had to stop, reflect on what families were needing at the moment, and as well as our employees, and recognize that um, we needed to pivot to meet community needs. Um, we provide um, early childhood, high quality early childhood for children zero to five. We have a program that serves uh, children from five to 12. Um, and then we also have uh, initiatives for seniors. And so um, when the pandemic hit, um, we had to basically go virtual. And so that meant that, you know, we had to um, work with our employees 
uh, to be able to provide them the training necessary to be able to move in that direction. Um, all while one aspect of our work, our home visiting program um, was in full operation. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, we've been pretty much essential uh, throughout the entire pandemic. And so um, we recently opened up in um, uh, July, I believe July 12th, we opened up our early ed centers. And just yesterday, we opened up our adult day services center. And so we, um, we maintained full staffing throughout the pandemic. Um, which is maybe in a unique position, and and as and as and as you said, Erica, we had to add staff, um, particularly in and around the different um, uh, experiences we were facing, both in terms of technology, marketing, communications, and human resources, which in essence were really part of our long strategic plan. So we said, you know what, let's move that up a little bit. Let's let's focus on that. Um, and really kind of provide the support that our agency needs from an operations perspective to thrive. Um, at the same time, we also had to be cognizant of the different needs of our employees and listen to them. Um, you know, we, all of us at the agency had to be up to speed uh, on the constant uh, changing dynamic in and around uh, emerging uh, um, HR policies regarding leave and family leave that were evolving. And, and really kind of listening to our employees and, and listening to what they were saying about their own needs and, and trying to provide the necessary accommodations. Um, thankfully, to, I mean, our, our, our employees are, are driven by mission and so they couldn't wait to come back. Um, but for those that couldn't, um, we've been working with them to identify what are the ways in which we can still support them and provide alternative forms of work for them that may be different from what they were doing before the pandemic so they can continue operating. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been really interesting throughout the pandemic, but it's really involved regardless of what um, seat you're in. I'm in the development seat. Um, I myself have had to uh, get involved with human resources and, and really kind of step up as a leader in the agency to support um, those initiatives and really sort of uh, uh, work and encourage um, my peers and colleagues um, to listen to um, employees around the different needs they're facing and, and really make sure that we were supporting them throughout this difficult and challenging time. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. And along those lines, Julio, can you tell us a little bit about what you've done to keep morale up while managing remote teams? Because this is really unique. Yeah, you know, it's it's a, a, a lot of virtual happy hours, if you will. Um, you know, sending uh, virtual lunches to employees. Um, uh, I think also flexibility, right, our employees are also um, uh, parents. And so understanding uh, what are their needs and making sure that they have that opportunity to do distance learning um, with their kids as well. Um, I also think too that it's, it's also been a big focus about engaging them on the health and safety protocol that are needed um, to reopen, right? Um, there's, there's what we hear from um, public health experts, the CDC, and then there's what we hear from our employees about what they want to see. And instead of us saying, well, here's your new protocol, go to work. Well, let's roll out with a draft. Let's have a town hall with you um, and really kind of check in and, 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 and get your input on this. You know, what did we miss? What should we include? And let's, and, and, and let's work to kind of to, to get you there. Um, I also think there's also been a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, one of the, the HR operational logistics that we or, or challenges that we could have faced was around managing PTO time. And so we really work with our employees to come up with a strategy and solution that still allowed them to, 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 to get their work done, but at the same time, allow them to take some critical time off um, during the, the sort of the, the start of the pandemic so that they could have um, some time and space to do what they also needed to do for their family. Um, in some cases, it also involved um, listening to their needs, right? Um, our, our, our employees, in many cases, also face some economic insecurity. And so at, at the same time, we also wanted to listen to them and understand what are some unique ways we can support them in the same way we're supporting our clients to be able to help them. Um, for, for some of them, it's also been things like, like gift cards um, to be able to help them buy groceries and whatnot. So, so really kind of listening to our employees and, and understanding what their needs are. And in some cases, those are some unique things, but in other cases, those were some collective things such as engagement. Yeah, those are really good recommendations and so fantastic. And 
um, you know, really would boost morale. It's, it's tricky to try to have that team camaraderie during this time when people are all over the place. Um, so I also want to talk about Lake County Haven. Laura, I know that you guys were preparing to open a new shelter leading into the pandemic. And then leading up to that, you hired and you were training all of these staff and then the pandemic hit. So can you talk to us a little bit about what that meant for the folks that you trained and hired? Yes. So we were, um, we had purchased a, had a big, first of all, had a big capital campaign to do this project, then finally purchased the home and furnished it. And so it was a, a multi-year build up to this moment, which was April 1st, we were going to open the doors. So I refer to this now as the worst and biggest April Fool's joke that anyone has ever played on me, <laughs> because of course we couldn't open because of the pandemic. And um, so we had hired a lot of people. Um, some of them had already been trained and were working every day for us. And those people stayed put. We didn't want to of course, you don't want anyone to lose their job if you can avoid it. And then there were a number of people who had been hired and trained, but were waiting kind of in the wings to start once the new shelter opened. So for them, it was a delay um, of a few months until we could open that new shelter. Um, and then since then, we actually have added um, a position. So, um, you know, we're kind of working in the, in the opposite direction now. Can I ask what that position is? Yeah, it's another case manager position. Great, great. Thank you. Um, and Jamie, I'm going to uh, call on you because I know that you have a legal background. Um, so there have been some questions fielded by NIU's center about recommendations if a legal issue pops up in relation to volunteers or board and staff um, as it pertains to COVID. Can you please tell us what you would recommend to nonprofits that might have that issue pop up? Uh, thanks, Erica. Yes, I have a legal background, but this is not legal advice. <laughs> I, you know, I think Julio touched on this very briefly. I think most of the issues we've seen are HR related, and thankfully there are some tremendous free resources out there. There's so much being printed and published and shared about what you can and cannot do during this time, um, and it's really clear. Um, and so there are resources out there to do that, but I honestly, the best advice I can give on this takes way be, happens way before a pandemic, which is to have lawyers on your board and um, to never feel like you're giving legal advice yourself and to be able to pass that on to that. That's one of the best roles a board can play to be able to pass that on to your board and have either that lawyer or that lawyer's firm that whatever the question is um, makes a huge difference. And most of these questions are pretty simple. Uh, anything more complicated, you're, you're in a different realm. But um, it's, you know, it's really to have that resource available. And if it's something you don't have now, I, I mean, my recommendation would be now is the right time to invest in someone that you can rely on um, to provide legal guidance for you on that kind of ad hoc basis, not necessarily ongoing legal work, but someone who can, can really look at what you're doing and give you kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down approach. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really good advice. And while I have you just to talk a little bit about communications as we shift into this focus of discussion. Um, you know, when programs were first closed at Kesha, how did you convey the messaging? I know there's also been some questions fielded about, um, you know, did you put this information on your website? I know some people are worried, like, do we, do we, are we transparent? I, which I, we always encourage, yes, you should be transparent, but um, in what way did you kind of communicate what was going on during this time, especially at the beginning of the pandemic? Yeah, so I look at March 12th as kind of like this watershed day for us, right? Yeah. We all, the news was building of like, this was obviously growing and was a concern and how is this being transmitted and what we're gonna do about this virus. And on March 12th, woke up really early and already had a text message from our um, chief program officer to me and the CFO being like, okay, are you guys ready to come in? And it, I mean, it was early. And so, you know, we grabbed some breakfast, came into the office and we basically spent the entire day together, um, almost like war room style. What is it we're gonna do? And we knew, you know, first it was like, okay, can we keep our programs open in person? And, and then it was like an hour later, it was like, no, we really can't. But every time, and then another hour later it was like, well, maybe we can do it for this program, but not this program. 
And, you know, although I am in development, a huge part of my job is communications. And so every hour I was rewriting an email that we hadn't sent yet. And so first it was like, here's how we're going to keep your program open. And then, then it was like, and then I'm about to hit send. And it was like, no, 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 no. Now we have to write, we're going to close. Then we have to write this. And um, we went through so many drafts. So it was finally like time out. We're going to pick one answer and we're going to send it out. And even if we have to send another email later on, um, well, but I can't keep all day, just keep rewriting emails and not sending them. And so we, we drew a line and told, we sent a very quick email telling people, we will let you know our plans at four o'clock. And then wherever we were at that point, we sent mass email communication out and then had um, our staff had already seen that communication, our frontline staff, and were prepared to answer questions. But I would say within those that first week or two, even before the governor had put in a stay at home order and we were both closing down in person programs and starting virtual opportunities. Um, it was daily communication to our families and uh, Erica, you mentioned well families stakeholders partners. I mean, we were sharing kind of everything with everyone um, and trying to write communications that were useful holistically. Um, you know, I, I think if we were a larger organization that had multiple people working in communications and marketing, you could really target those communications. We kind of had to put everything into one so that we could, you know, be consistent. But I, you know, our website, you mentioned websites, our website is not great. And I don't really think it's necessarily a resource for people. Um, but when we did end up using our website as a mode for trans uh, information, was we run summer camp programs and I felt it was really important, not only in the marketing part of this, but also throughout um, actually having kids come back into our in-person programs is we put our policies and procedures online. Yeah. And um, the scariest part for me about that, and maybe this is the law background, is that when you put mm -hmm. it online like that, you actually have to do what you're saying um, and that those things have to be up to date. And so if you end up changing your practice, in person while you're operating because you have to, you know, like some things make sense on paper, but are different once you put them into practice. There had to be a complete method of recommunication back to me to be able to update what we were doing so that what reflected online was actually what was happening in person. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of transparency and it's been a lot of just ongoing, very open communication. And even at times admitting that we don't know. Right. And it's, you know, this is what we're going to do. We, we're just not sure. We're in uncharted territory right now. Yep. Thank you. That's really helpful for everyone to hear. Um, and I know that Chicago Commons has also done a really wonderful job of shifting messaging away from being pandemic focused and articulating the resiliency of your organization. So Julio, can you please tell us a bit about the ways in which you've been communicating to your audience and how you kind of determine what messaging would be most effective in communicating the importance of your mission during the pandemic? Sure, happy to, Erica. Uh, so much like um, my colleague Jamie, when the pandemic hit, we rolled out with a, you know, day one, we sat in a war room, same thing, just trying to understand and communicate on the spot, but then quickly moved into developing kind of like a six tier um, crisis communications plan where we kind of scenario plan what happened if, right? What do we say? What do we do? Um, and that created a lot of anxiety, but I think that having this plan helped us um, during the moment of crisis be able to understand, okay, who needs to be involved in this decision? What are we saying? What are the key messages? Who needs to know first, right? And how do we roll this out? And what channels do we get this out to, right? Does it have to be a text message? Does it have to be an email? Are we prepared to do that? You know day one was just get it out there as best you can come week two we really had to tighten the screws on our on our communications channels um once pretty much around july 4th as the as the state started moving into um you know reopening phases if you will and and we knew we were looking at reopening our centers um we knew that we needed to change the message um with within the organization both internally and externally and never for a minute did we say this is, we're only talking with our internal constituency. Um, we, for the most part, have been talking internally and externally the same message. What are we experiencing and what are we doing? Um, and then uh, pretty much around, around July 4th, in around that time period, um, when the state was moving into 
um, its next phase of the pandemic, um, we knew we needed to uh, understand and, and really empathize with the fact that some of our employees have been um, really resilient along the way, they've adapted. Um, some of our employees are still trying to figure it out. They are, are, um, they are looking for, um, for us for guidance. They're looking for us to, um, to have something to, to grapple onto. And some people are still surviving, right? They may have lost someone due to COVID-19. Um, their uh, family members may have lost their jobs or they might be uh, struggling with, with caring for children while they're working at the same time. There are a lot of things going on. And so what we said is that, you know, at that moment, we were going to shift our message from responding and reacting to expressing the resiliency of the organization going forward. And, 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 go, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but being an organization in the round for now 126 years, there's been a lot of resiliency in this agency, right? We've survived wars, political strife, and past pandemics. And so we really kind of um, uh, lean back on some of that and, and put our, our CEO at the forefront as he's always been. And, and, and we work with him to say, and, and really it was him that kind of said, you know what, we have to shift our message. We have to talk about, you know, um, that we're one commons, we're united, um, we're here for our communities. And, and you know what, we're gonna do what we have to do in, in order to move forward, but we're gonna listen to you along the way. And so it became this kind of subtle shift um, where resiliency became the word. Um, we started again, focusing on some of these stories um, and, and the stories of resiliency weren't about, you know, what had happened in the past, it about what, what, we're, do, what we're doing today. It was about uh, Miss Russell downstairs, who was working with the bus drivers to go and deliver meals to seniors, even though that wasn't part of her job description, no one told her what to do that. It's about the resiliency that she had, that her team had um, for employees to be able to go out there and, and, and be supportive of, of, of the seniors who themselves were expressing this resiliency to stay engaged in community. So, so it was really focusing on the, on the re resiliency of, of, our, of our team members here at Commons and what they were doing to, 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 to move forward. Or, you know, and, and really kind of focusing those three themes, the, the survivors, the adapters, um, and the third were, were those that, that really needed some, some, some direction or, 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 or some, some guidance along the way. Yeah, honoring your values as an organization and your mission, right? That's um, right. Yeah, and I think that it is, it's so important. I mean, the messaging had to change, right? And so it's kind of that perfect dance between, you know, not completely uphauling and redoing, but to um, change it still within the voice of your organization and representing what your organization embodies. And so I know that Lake County Haven has a tremendous Facebook presence. And I know this is a way that you've always engaged a lot of your supporters. I just wanna take a quick moment to share with all of you a screenshot that I took um, of this. So um, yeah, so they have these really wonderful, happy um, messages throughout and they're kind of showing what supporters and community members do for Lake County Haven. And you can go onto their Facebook page and they have a lot of these, which I think is so great because it's tough. And, and to continue to spread this joy and to show the positives is um, staying true to their brand. So Laura, can you kind of talk a little bit about how you updated your community about Lake County Haven's efforts at the start of the pandemic and even continue to do that, but that you've been really cognizant of maintaining your typical Facebook image, which is positive and cheerful. Yeah, it's a tough balance to strike. Um, so, you know, of course we had to talk about it and we talked about it in, a e, in one or two e-blasts that we sent out and in our newsletter and occasionally on Facebook in a very specific way in terms of this is how our meal program is changing. If you wanna donate dinner, these are kind of the new rules. But, um, but we don't, you know, it, that's, a, that's a minority of the messages on, on Facebook. I, the majority of it is like what you saw there, which, you know, clearly it's a pandemic because those two little kids have masks on, but um, it's a happy part of it where people are con continuing to bring us meals and sometimes it's people dropping off masks and things like that. So the, the community is kind of highlighted in their work that they're doing 
whether it's a, they do it if it's a pandemic or if it's not a pandemic. So, and, and we do, we really try to keep a positive, happy, upbeat Facebook image and we always have. And I think that that's why people follow us. And if, we, if I were to suddenly start putting a lot of pictures of that coronavirus, you know, which you see everywhere and things like that, that I just, I fear that we would lose people. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's just not who you're typically attracting in terms of the people that want to engage with you and hear about your news. Um, but you've also had that delicate dance of still acknowledging it. So I think it's really important for people on this call to see, you know, it's, it's stay within your brand, um, but, you know, still acknowledge the reality of what's happening because we're all in it. Um, so I want to shift to uh, programs. So let me just go back here and shift us to programs and research. So these are actually a couple of the programs of our organizations that are speaking today. Jamie, at Keshet, your residents have continued living in their apartments during this time. So how did your programmatic work change to ensure their safety? And how did other programs at Keshet have to change as well? Uh, so at Keshet, we operate in four main areas, um, education, recreation, employment, and supported housing. And um, obviously the housing, in terms of closing down a program, the housing piece in a lot of ways is the hardest. I mean, you are where someone's home. Um, but we're also in a fortunate position that I don't think any of us realized until this started that at least as of right now, the ages of the adults who live with us um, are still, I mean, they're younger adults. So let's say they're mostly 45 and younger and they're, they still have family in the area. A lot of, most of them have, their parents are still alive and live in the area. So when the pandemic first started, we were prepared. We made, uh, we had preparation plans to be able to keep operating. And, um, but presented to the families and our residents, the option of staying with us and we would keep going as you know, to the best of our ability as we normally do or um, they could return back to their families' homes. And we were actually very surprised that initially every, everyone chose to go back to their family's home. And um, like really, really surprised. And I think that was in part because everyone thought this will be a couple of weeks, right? So my, you know, um, you know, as a, you know, our 40 year old resident thinking, okay, so I go live with my mom and dad for a few weeks and I'll be back in my apartment. And then weeks turned into months and, um, which was really, it was challenging. We were running all virtual programs. We had staff going into people's homes or in backyards to provide support. We had all kinds of things going on with our residents. But it was also the first program we were able to reopen and had to really reopen um, to you know, welcome people back into their homes. And so we've done it in a staggered way. We don't currently have everyone back yet. Um, and that's mostly on the choice of the families and the residents, not us. So again, we're prepared. But, um, it, we dramatically changed everything. You know, this we operate like a regular apartment building. People come and go. They go to work. They, you know, they go grocery shopping. Almost all of that has stopped. And um, you know, we now where we're used to having all of our residents employed or volunteers during the day. None of them are currently employed. We went from a hundred percent employment rate to a ninety-four percent unemployment rate of our of our uh, adults, which is and not just the adults that live with us. The adults we serve in across the board, um, which is sad um, and scary. And we have shifted for those, the people living in our homes to really be offering adult day services in our homes. So we have an adult day program that generally operates out externally. Now we brought those staff into the homes. Um, there are very um, strict uh, health and safety protocols and guidelines. We've changed how cleaning is done, how food preparation is done. Um, there's no visitors allowed in and out. Um, and really trying our best to keep people um, safe, safe and healthy. And it's, you know, every time a new resident moves back in, we're starting that quarantine process all over again. So it's been this continual readjustment um, that will probably continue, I'm guessing, through February at this point. Um, we also, similar to what Laura talked about, we opened a home during the pandemic, uh, was supposed to open in the third week of March. <laughs> Definitely was not happening. Um, but by June, we felt comfortable that we could 
um, we had, you know, our staff were already trained, right? They were ready to open two weeks later. So we had been employing people who weren't actually working, which was challenging, but really important to do. Um, and that we felt comfortable that we could reopen, we could welcome people back safely. Um, the families were on board, the residents were on board. And so, you know, in the midst of all of this craziness where everything felt like it shut down, we were still starting new. So, you know, it's, it will be an interesting process, but I think, um, again, you know, touching back on what I first talked about, one of the things that was able to get us through this was to be able to look towards other organizations that also provide supported housing and see what they were doing. Um, Cause most of them had never shut down like we were able to, um, to be able to figure out how to keep, you know, keep operating with, in the most safe environment that we think we can provide. Yeah, it's really challenging. And I often think of programs as kind of the heart and soul of the organization, really on the ground, advancing the mission. So to have a disruption to the programs, um, you know, that ripple effect to the organization and all these different shifts that we're talking about really just happens and, and has to be something that everyone is aware of in every department. Um, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about what's been kind of changing with your programs since the start of the pandemic at Lake County Haven, please? Yeah, sure. So we are a residential program for homeless women and children. And um, so we have a scattered site housing program, which is mostly independent apartments. So that wasn't affected very much, um, but we do have our shelter, which is a group home. And um, then we have the additional shelter we're about to open. So. We did, um, we took people out of the shelter for a few months and put them all in individual hotel rooms uh, with kitchenettes so that if one of them got sick, they weren't gonna infect everybody else. And we did that back in the beginning when everybody was thinking, oh yeah, this is gonna last for a few weeks or a few months, you know? And then when, we, when it became clear that it was a much longer term uh, situation, um, we brought them back to the shelter, but we only could put one person per bedroom. So it's drastically changed, you know, the capacity of, uh, of the number of people we could serve. And then it's also really changed um, uh, the way that we deliver services because a lot of what we do is um, in what we call a day program, which is usually you know, about five hours of classes and groups a day where all the women come together and the staff lead these groups and, you know, builds a lot of community and the feeling of not being alone in your struggles. And we convey a lot of information that way. And we couldn't do that. So we um, were doing it on Zoom, which is something. It's not as good as being in person, but um and then we reduce the, the amount of that that we do it because people get Zoom fatigue, you know, it's different than being in person. So, um, and then another thing that we've noticed really changing, of course, this is no surprise because of all the people losing their jobs is that um, it's taking much longer for the women in our program to get employed and, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of move on that way, but they are still doing it, which is really wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's really tough. And um, with, you know, to have less capacity is really tough. When you want to have more of an impact as an organization, you're limited in that way. It's just, it's got to be just eating away at you in a way because you just want to do more and, and there's not enough space. And I think that goes hand in hand with revenue, um, which I kind of want to shift gears and talk a little bit about fundraising and the board and the need for that. Um, so I just want to show uh, this really great example I think people would appreciate seeing of a thank you note that um, Chicago Commons created and it really is all tied in to the pandemic and to what support during this time has gone towards and that impact that the organization has been able to have during COVID because of the support for COVID relief and for the COVID relief fund. And then Julio, um, you know, with this in line, can you talk a little bit about the changes in the way that you've, you know, you can talk a little bit about this and then also what it's meant for fundraising as a fundraiser, as the head of fundraising for the organization. And similarly, how do you utilize your board? What, what, was, what was that like, especially in the beginning? And how often are you communicating with them during this time? What does that all look like? Sure, no, absolutely. Um, you know, for, for me, I would say the principles of fundraising never changed, right? 
um, engagement and the donor cycle, that, that still stays with us. And I really have to give credit to our board um, for stepping up and, you know, part of the resiliency of the organization is, you know, as we've weathered all those things, but in the past, you know, five to 10 years, you know, we've weathered the economic crisis, the state budget crisis, and other sorts of issues that have come forward. And, and, and Commons is in a stronger position today and, and able to make it through it because of our board. Um, when the crisis hit, we immediately moved to weekly meetings with the executive committee of the board that were fully open and transparent to all board members where we would provide updates on what we were experiencing and what we're hearing in regards to the, the business or operations of the agency. Um, right away, our board asked the question, what can we do to help? And um, they developed this concept of building the COVID-19 relief fund, which was sort of thinking about all the things that we had to do proactively in order to respond, right? Everything from the PPE or the, 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 the face coverings to the hand sanitizer, to the modifications to facilities to operate safely that added on cost. And we basically decided, you know what, um, during this time, we're not gonna shy away from asking for money, but at the same time, we're gonna reach out um, to our donors, those most loyal and check in on them. Um, being an organization been around for a while, we have um, uh, donors who, who are in their glory years. And so in their best years, if you will, and so naturally for them, you know, there was um, a, a moment for us to check in and, and say, well, what do you need? How can we help you? Um, and every time we place those calls, it became, well, what can we do for you? And, um, you know, we raised, uh, you know, we just came out of 125th anniversary celebration, which uh, again, thanks to Evolve Group and Jamie for helping to kind of position the messaging uh, leading up to it. Thankfully, we had that back in November, but we had just done this big raise back then. And here we are coming back to them for another opportunity. But, you know, crisis, uh, crisis opportunities are different. And, and for those that care about the agency, you know, the, the immediate thing was, well, we, should, we provided an update and they said, they said, well, how can we help? And we said, you know, we created this messaging around the COVID-19 re relief fund, which provided some sort of very clear um, messages around what this was going to, you know, some of it going to adaptations for facilities, and the other going directly to families, uh, I believe about 60% going directly to families in the form of uh, economic assistance, food, utilities, housing, um, you, you name it. And the board responded all in right away within the first two weeks. Um, and then from there, we ramped out. Uh, we held a virtual briefing, um, They or a town hall, we called it. Um, they invited folks, we invited donors. We got everyone on the same page. We said, this is where we're at, this is what we're doing. And then the accountability piece, what you see there, the postcard is really our way of sort of coming back to them and saying, here's our accountability, here's how we've invested your dollars, here's, here's what it's meant. Um, and so, so we're getting ready to enter a new cycle um, in our work and, and our new cycles focus on the next challenge that we're facing um, with the pandemic. And that's the support that essential workers need in and around care for children and their, and their um, uh, older adults, the, the seniors in their household that may need um, uh, additional support, but maybe they don't um, have enough income to support the co-pays surrounding that. So we're readying, readying that effort and, and it's helpful um, to walk into a visit with someone having shared with them in advance, well, what's been the outcome of, of our work? Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the context. Again, our, our board, we just did a golf outing, you know, of, of all the things that are taking place. We had a golf outing that was sold out on Monday, um, highest revenue generating golf outing and, and highest net. Um, the, the, the committee as well as the sponsors agreed we, we won't have a sit down gathering, even though if it was outdoors and socially distance, distant, they said, you know, let's not take any risk or chances. Let's do that and instead invest some of those dollars directly into the COVID-19 response. So um, again, just going back to the principles of fundraising around engagement and just kind of um, working that cycle and, and understanding where folks are at in the process and being mindful of that um, has helped guide us along the way. Um, and then constant check-in with our board. Our, our board is now reading this next initiative um, and, and they're, they're thinking about doing small virtual gatherings or briefings um, with friends and family in and around what we're experiencing. So, so for Commons, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're being open about what we're experiencing, but we're also using it as a moment to um, move into um, 
a, a major gift uh, campaign, which again goes back to the work we did with Evolve around setting this sort of you know one, two, three year plan around around building our infrastructure in the development team. Thank you so much. And yes, I, I think that you know I know Jamie's over nodding her head, Jamie Klobuchar, because you know this is exactly what we are you know preaching at Evolve, giving your boot. It's really important to be in constant communication with your board um, more now than ever before and with your supporters and not to make any assumptions during this time, whether someone can or cannot support, make sure you're checking in with them, getting to know them. And um, I think there's been a lot of pleasant surprises during this time and, and really just getting to know people on a different level. And then there's a lot of great opportunities because you can get everyone to meet that may not have been all in the same place before and now we're all at home. So we'll talk a little bit um, at the end of this about some of these positives as well that have kind of come out of having to live in this virtual world. Um, I want to take a moment to share a video clip from Keshet. Um, they were so innovative and along the lines of stewardship of donors, they actually filmed videos that they shared on social media of them going to donors' homes and thanking them. So I'm going to share this and then we'll have Jamie kind of give a little bit more of a backstory. You are now live. Uh -huh. Hey everyone, welcome to our first reveal of our randomly selected donor for the Forward 2020 campaign. Uh, here we are at the Silverman's house with their, uh, the, the campaign that they generously donated to, Katie Penn, longtime volunteer and summer camp counselor. And here we have our special surprise. <laughs> successful Forward 2020 campaign. So Jamie, can you talk about how fundraising has obviously changed in this virtual world for Kesha and your leadership? <laughs> yeah, this is actually our attempt at keeping what we normally do going. Um, you know, since I've been at Kesha, most of the campaign or efforts we've done in terms of uh, live fundraising have all been very short, you know, one day, two day, kinds of things. And we find that the, what's most helpful is when we can bring people into our programs to see them live. And so we often do we use Facebook Live and Instagram Live and all kinds of ways of doing tours of facilities and um, other kinds of things where you, our, our participants and families are actually speaking about their experiences, which when we went to go plan the campaign that we ran in June and uh, sorry, July and August, we couldn't do anymore. And, um, and so somewhere in a brainstorming session, I don't even know if it was someone from Evolve, it was someone from our team said, well, maybe we can just surprise donors every week and we could do it as like a drawing. So we would just pull a name of a donor and then do something at their house that we could then broadcast live. So this was actually the first week of it. And as you can see, we brought a trombone player um, to do a sidewalk serenade with a trombone in front of someone's house. And it was really fun. We've got a lot of engagement and a lot of comments um, on social media. And I, I don't think people were giving with the hope that we were gonna randomly show up at their house. But for us, this is a way of, it was a way of just bringing some like levity and lightness and just fun, which is who we are. Um, to our fundraising process. And uh, each, it was like each week got a little better. There was a week that we had an ice cream truck come to someone's house. We did like those lawn signs, one that said like, thank you, love Kesha on someone's lawn. Uh, we did balloon displays, we had a magic show at someone's house. <laughs> you know, it was just these very little things and it was happening every Friday. And um, when we went around and we're talking post campaign in the past couple of weeks with people like what's something that really stood out what would be something you'd recommend for us to do again this is what came up time and time again that i just think across the board was a, a very engaging piece and it and it fit 
um, I think with our personality and, you know, in some way similar to what Laura was, you know, talking about in terms of her Facebook presence, this is, you know, this is really who we are in terms of actually getting out there and meeting people. And everyone was, was I mean, there were people that, uh, and these weren't necessarily people we knew, right? This happened to be the cousins of one of our camp counselors who happened to give to her, I think, you know, like it gave like $20 to her peer to peer campaign or whatever it was, pulled them when we showed up there and that's kind of what happened. So, um, but Erica, I can't remember how much more, did you want me to keep talking about our campaign or just focus on this piece? No, I mean, that's great. If you want to share anything about the campaign, sure. I'm sure people would love to hear it. I think it's just really creative and a really great way to honor who you all are as a Keshet family and community. And so I thought it was just really important to show ways in which we can kind of change you know, stewardship during this time. And it's, it's still in line with who you are very much, but going around and making it more accessible to others too, to, to witness and bringing some levity, like you said, some brevity. So um, thank you so much. Um, and I, I think that, you know, going as, as I'm kind of cautious of time and I wanna make sure that there's one really cool thing that I wanna show. It's a narrative uh, from Chicago Commons um, so this is really neat. Um, it's by the original founder of Chicago, Chicago Commons, Julio shared it with me, and her name was Leah Taylor, and Leah was the daughter of Graham Taylor, and she kept these impeccable records and used data to inform her decisions and communicated her impact through these annual reports to donors and was really ahead of her time. Um, Julio kind of told me that they really just kept, she kept great track of donor histories and notes within their data. Um, and I am such a big fan and proponent. I know that all of us at Evolve really care about making things sustainable and typing in all of your notes and trying your best, even when you have so much work to really make sure that you're thinking about how that's going to live on for the future. So I think this is such a neat example of that um, during, you know, during the time in 1918 when there was this influenza. Um, and, and to show this a little bit more, Julio, Chicago Commons, as you mentioned earlier, and kind of circling back to that, has been around the longest out of the organizations that are we're talking about during today's panel. And I know you found these narratives in response to, you know, facing this pandemic. You guys kind of dug in and looked at your archives. So do you think that Chicago Commons has found some lessons learned from that time that have really helped the way in which you're working today? I, I, absolutely, and, and really, uh, uh, Per, you know, Dr. Alicia, um, really kind of credit to her as well. Um, a while back, uh, maybe right before the pandemic, or maybe it's right at the start of the pandemic, um, she did a session with with myself and my team, and maybe a, a session with another one of my team members, where we were able to um, jump in a little bit deeper. Graham, um, you know, in, in many ways, Graham and, and Leah were, were the founders, Graham, her father, and, and Leah. But it was really Leah who set this strong foundation. It's what I learned from, from Alicia um, uh, that in many ways sort of reaffirms the best practices around, you know, running a nonprofit, whether it was today or, 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 or you know, back in 1918, 1919, about um, documenting, being transparent, about tracking outcomes, um, and really kind of understanding a little bit of the context in and around you. For us, what, what that has meant for us and, and for our employees is, is sort of going back to them and showing this artifact and saying, look, they got through this and we can get through this too, right? Um, to go back and recognize that the work and the spirit of what our employees are doing today, you know, I, I talked a little bit about Deliza and our folks in the ADS, you know, Ethel, who's one of our home care aides who goes and visits in seniors' homes, um, uh, those in African American communities most impacted by the pandemic and lifting up her story in many ways no different than the workers who were um, uh, back then working with, with people impacted by the pandemic to bring them basic needs and essential services. In many ways it's been really pivotal for us to, to go back to both our donors as well as our, our employees and, and, and really kind of get down into what is the core of our mission and why we do what we do and, 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 and making sure that folks see that like, this is the spirit of commons and you were part of building this commons where, where, where families go further. Um, so, so we really found her messages to be really inspirational. Um, I, I think we go back and, and we look at 
what she's done, both in terms of um, donor records, you know, the, the, the legacy that other CEOs have left, and, 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 and for our team, maybe the greatest lesson learned is how do we continue to build on this amazing foundation that Leah, Graham, and others along the way have left, so that way Commons can be around for another 125 years in the future. So, um, so, so we continue to learn, uh, but, it, but, but it is very inspiring uh, in, in moments when we find these, these, these gems to be able to pull out and, and share with folks and, and, and folks have some context, right? Because yeah. um, and it's, and it's close and, and people can recognize with it. I do the same work. I work for the same agency and I'm, and I'm following and I'm leading the mission of the agency the way it was, it was meant to be several, you know, uh, more than a hundred years ago. Yeah, that's really inspiring and truly remarkable to kind of take a look at your roots as an organization and your history that is so rich and to use that during this tough time and to know, you know, what happened then and what worked and how um, the organization was resilient, as you mentioned earlier, that's just such a key word that I feel like, you know, really honors Chicago Commons. And then I also am sure that, that this messaging and looking at that and knowing that this has happened is, is really helping to boost that morale that we were talking about earlier, um, you know, during teams to see that this is, you know, this has happened. It's been a long time, but it's happened. Um, and we will get through. And so with that note, as we kind of move into our q and I just want to end on a positive because there really are so many strengths of our sector um, and positives in our sector during this time, including the frontline workers that are, you know, advancing all of the work and risking their health to help others. Um, so I want to go around and kind of hear what positives are a takeaway as an outcome of shifting the way in which you work and what you think you're going to continue to adopt and what you might recommend to our attendees that are all, you know, nonprofit, carers, workers, professionals, leaders, in terms of how should we all pave this path forward since that's our theme for today. So Laura, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, um, hmm. <laughs> You know, I guess the, I, I think of that quotation, uh, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> so, you know, we're hoping we fall into the second uh, category of those, you know, and not get killed and made stronger. But, um, you know, we, um, you have to be, uh, I think as an organization, um, you have to understand that tough times are going to happen and you have to plan for it when times are good. And um, I think we're feeling good as an organization that we did that and that we have a fund for a rainy day because it might be a tight year or two. So, um, you know, we've, we're feeling good about that and, um, you know, just you know, kind of set our sights on the future as things someday return back to normal again. Yeah. Absolutely. One of these days. <laughs> Soon, I hope. For all of us. Jamie, what about you? Uh, <laughs> I know, so I, I know actually... one. I'm going to say one because I know that you guys, since you are, you know, overseeing fundraising, I think it's really neat. You know, you were kind of starting to pivot away from that event-based fundraising. So that's got to be a positive, right? Yeah, there's so many. Um, but I think in terms of fundraising, this is a really good one. You know, with the help of Evolve and a new strategic plan or being in the second year of implementation of a strategic plan, um, the recommendation had been very strong that we should move away from event-based event fundraising to more relationship-based fundraising. And we had to cancel, we run two very large events every year and our event in March um, had to be canceled uh, right before we closed programs. And then, um, and, and so it didn't happen. And then we were supposed to have a concert in November, which clearly cannot happen either. So we were left in a position where we were doing this very slow sea change of trying to move away from how the organization had fundraised um, to what we needed to be, which I would have thought we were probably had about another 18 months or so to get to where we needed to be. We ended up making that shift in about six weeks. 
um, because we had to. And uh, I think that if I have to look at the silver lining, I mean, we could have we could have slowly moved this process along for years. Um, but when the, when the event option is taken away, suddenly then we really had to shift and we did it very, very quickly um, and kind of hoped that our donors would follow along with us. And, you know, we did. I, we ran um, our largest kind of mo most transition, tra traditional largest campaign in the past two months that's ever been run. It's the first time we ever did a real peer-to-peer -peer campaign we had 600 pe 610 people who have never donated to us before give um, in the you know in the last eight weeks, which is now the real work begins of how to keep them connected. But there, you know, we've made some major shifting, and I think, and that isn't going to change. We're not going to go back. I I would love to be able to do an event again where we can get our community together, but more for the sake of bringing people together than necessarily thinking this is going to be our our. Um, large, you know, our, what we're going to hang our fundraising hat on for the year. Um, the only other thing I will say, and it's the craziest thing, but there's been something about us being a part as an organization that has actually, I think, staff-wise brought us much, much closer together. Yeah. You know, when, when you're really cognizant that everyone is in a different place and people are all, all over the place, we got so much better at communicating to our staff. And for so many reasons in terms of committees and task force, task forces and um, different kinds of decisions that were made. We had to pull from staff who work in so many different areas who had never really worked face to face before. In fact, I don't know if they'd ever really seen each other before, knew each other. And so there was a lot of new communication, a lot of new thoughts that came together and just a lot of, um, I think, a feeling of camaraderie, even though we were so separated. Um, and even now as our programs have begun, to open in person again, you see, we can still see the lingering pieces of that. Like there's a book club. Whoever knew that we would have a staff book club and um, that really has staff from, you know, we, we operate in you know between 40 and 70 different places depending on the time of year from people from all over the place being able to be part of that. And I think that that is a cultural shift in our organization that no one wants to let go of. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think, you know, I know we were all talking before in preparation for this, and that's something that really resonated with me is that that communication and understanding of what every single function and every single staff member is doing at nonprofit organizations right now is um, is very clear. And sometimes you might be a little bit more siloed, um, especially larger or mid-sized organizations versus, you know, a five-person staff where you're constantly like yelling at each other through the offices. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's, that's really, that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And Julio, what are some positive takeaways for you during this tough time? You know, I think for me, it's just re reaffirming some advice I received from a donor some time ago. We were like on our fifth visit with this donor. We were touring the neighborhood um, and he was sitting in the front seat of a vehicle and we were showing him all the things that, that we had done. And um, he leaned back and he said to myself and our CEO, um, something neither myself nor Sido, um were are Jewish. Um, he himself is Jewish, and he, and he gave some a piece of advice from Rabbi Tarfan, who's I believe from you know seventy Common Era, right? Um, and 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 the, and the saying was, you're you're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. In other words, um, it's amazing that you're doing this work, and there's a lot of pressure to do this work but also give yourself the break to know that it's a continual process and an evolution. And so um, just keep moving the work forward and put it in a position where you can hand it off to the next person so they can continue the work um, was, 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 a, was a lesson that um, this particular donor had, had, had stuck with me for some years. And, and I think it reiterates now in, in that, you know, there, there are things that come at us from, from every angle. And I think as um, uh, nonprofit employees, leaders in the nonprofit sector, um, we're, we're called upon at all hours of the day um, to respond and support. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that, you know, we're, we're all human and we can only do so much and it's okay, right? Well, it, it's, yeah. it's okay to, to, to keep moving forward in that way. So um, a little bit of a different kind of lesson, but just sort of, um, you know, take care of yourself um, and take care of your colleagues and, and have a little bit of, of self-care for yourself as well 
in the process, right? You can't continue to build community if you don't care for yourself as well. Thank you, Julio. That is so profound and so true. And I think that everyone on this call, I'm seeing some comments, agrees, you know, it's a really, it's, we're already stretched thin in our sector, let's be real. And so um, now more than ever, when you are so passionate about moving forward a mission, um, it's already hard enough sometimes in our work to make sure to put yourself first. And in a pandemic world, even trickier when you're worrying so much about those that are being you know, impacted by the shift in your mission and, 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 you know, negatively impacted and not being helped or, you know, like Laura was saying, if, you know, you know, you have to have smaller program sizes and you can't help as many people during this time, I mean, it's really tough. So I think that right now we should all just like give yourself a hug <laughs> or pat yourself <laughs> on the back, everyone on this call, because we're all within this sector and we're all doing great work and you have to take care of yourself. So thank you. That's a really Great way for us to shift before we start going into our Q&A. So I just want to open it up to Q&A before we officially close today's webinar. We have about 15 minutes, so please feel free to send questions. And if something does not get answered during this time, we will make sure to follow up. If you're directing it to a panelist or to a Vault Giving Group or someone else, we will make sure and get um, that discussion or question answered for you. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna lob one question that I think is 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 particularly timely, um, and I I think I'm gonna lob this over to Julio and Laura first. So this is from Sarah. She said, as we are facing multiple pandemics, have any of your organizations addressed equity issues, especially as we see our black indigenous people and people of color stakeholders hit dis hit disproportionately harder by covid and you know in light of the social justice uprising i'll, I'll jump in jamie if that's okay um yeah. i think i think for us you know as an organization that's primarily black and brown and 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 what unfortunately has happened and continues to happen um, we've been very public and vocal about um, our position on Black Lives Matter and saying Black Lives Matter. And it's important for us to say that. Um, I think it's important for us, for our employees to acknowledge, you know, where we're at and also to acknowledge that, you know, I think at the same time when we look at our agency, we strive to have um, diversity and inclusion in our agency, but we also recognize that we're, we're not perfect as well. Um, and so, so to that end, um, we've led some uh, conversations with our employees around diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, it started in, in one segment of our work where um, we work particularly in, in, in black and brown communities in Chicago um, that we're experiencing. I, I live in, 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 in one of those neighborhoods um, and, and, and sort of, you know, trying to provide some um, uh, baseline understanding around right common set of language to create dialogue. And then from there, moving into um, inaction uh, uh, posture, if you will, you know, we've committed as a leadership group to do an assessment and analysis on, on our own sort of um, uh, scorecard, if you will, on, on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And then I think along the way, one of the pivots that we're making, you know, in alignment with COVID, but I think more so than we have been before, is to be a lot more um, transparent about that. So not a day goes by where we're not talking about the makeup of our board, the makeup of our leadership leadership team, the makeup of our staff, um, race, gender, ethnicity, um, you know, all that all that comes to bear. We strive to have a board that's um, representative of the diversity of the city, and we strive to we strive to have a staff that's representative of the diversity of the people that we serve. And so those are sort of the the, the initial benchmarks that we have, but we know we need to go deeper. Um, and so we're engaged in that process. We know it's going to take some time um, and, uh, and and love to report back, you know, in a few months, um, how we're doing, how, how we're doing. But I think, I think for the most part, it's, it's been first being vocal, uh, recognize the, 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 the current state that we're in and then, and then sort of, you know, engaging, as I said before, about engaging employees about the pandemic, it's engaging them as well about, you know, what it is they might need or want to see or want us to do as an agency and then, and then working that into our plans moving forward for us. That's, that's where we're at right now. That's great. Laura, do you have anything to add that you're, that, that this is kind of 
you know, inspired or, or caused some conversation at the Haven? Yeah, so um, what, the way that this kind of plays out for us is that we really like to talk about it a lot in our groups, in our day program groups with the women, you know, because we're all seeing this play out on the news. We're seeing it play out around us. You know, it can feel pretty threatening. Um, and so we think that's really important to deal with um, on an emotional level, personally, and also to tie it into kind of the larger um, societal and systemic levels. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. Okay, thanks. Another question that we got here, and I think I might lob this one over to Jamie. Um, the question is, have certain organizations tried to partner together during this time to tackle issues collaboratively? And I know, Jamie, that Keshet has a ton of partnerships, right? Because your programs run in schools, your camps run with other partner organizations. So I just kind of wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit more about what those partnerships have looked like during this time and how you may have done some joint problem solving. Absolutely. I, um, you know, you think you know who your partners are and then something happens and you're suddenly like, okay, we really know who the partner organizations are and where you can put aside some of the competition for dollars or, um, you know, even even uh, clientele to really be able to look things forward. And for us, it's mostly been the um, the other uh, disability organizations in our space, some of whom we knew well and some of whom we didn't, um, that have really, we've been able to come together to provide services to people that we probably weren't reaching before or weren't reaching in the same way. So um, at Cash It, we were able to get our, our feet under us to do virtual programming, particularly for adults, uh, really fat within day, within like two a day, two days of us closing our in-person program. And um, at a time when people, other organizations were still trying to figure out what to do, we were already doing it. So we were able to invite, uh, and we were doing it for free. That was part of when we set what were our goals during this time. Um, one of them was to um, be able to offer virtual programs to the community at no cost. And so we were able to invite a whole lot of people into our world, and um, which made particularly other people, other organizations that run supported housing or adult day programs were very appreciative to have some where even if it was just temporary to have people have a meaningful day um, through a computer screen. And then in turn, when it came time for us to figure out how to reopen or what were we going to do about this or how were you getting, you know, we can't get hand sanitizer anywhere. Where are you getting it from? Just to even have those very tact, um, tactical conversations with another organization was extremely, extremely helpful. And, um, I, I, you know, those partnerships, I, some existed before and some didn't. And I think, though, that they haven't stopped. Those conversations in a very collegial way have continued going. Um, now, at some point, I'm sure it will go back to our normal normal world. But I, I think, you know, to be able to say, okay, to have that gut check with another organization in the same space has been um, extremely helpful for our program staff. And, um, you know, something that will continue. And what also it has actually ended up doing is it's brought in some um, large foundation support that we wouldn't have had otherwise, because as we know, funders like to be able to, they like the idea of community partnership or organizations working together so they're not duplicating services. So a group of the um, organizations in our space all receive, <laughs> all received grant dollars to be able to provide direct support dollars to families in need. And that's not the business any of us are really ever in. And unlike the other two panelists on here, that was totally new for us. I almost said no to the money. because I'm like, we don't have a system to even distribute that kind of support. Um, and, and their response was, well, you guys will figure it out. And if you figured out this, this, and this, you're gonna be able to figure out how to get this money to the people who need it. And um, it's turned out you know, to be one of, I think, the again, another one of these blessings that's happened is that we've been able to reach people, um, families with disabilities who really needed immediate support um, by providing, you know, um, utility, food, um, rent, support that we would have never happened if we hadn't come together and some funders hadn't realized that we were all working together. Great, thank you. That's, that's a great, um, that's a great answer to that question. Um, 
Another question that we have, and I might throw this back to Laura, what were the, some of the things that you had wanted to implement, but you were unable to at this time because of specifically because of funding issues? I just know you run the tightest budget <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> and I've always been really impressed by how you are able to do, you know, manage that and, and really provide such excellent services. But I wonder if there's anything you had to kind of eliminate, cut back because of, of these times. Um, well, you know, so I spoke about not being able to open the shelter on time um, already. Um, there was nothing that was slated to start now, you know, and then we lost the funding. So that didn't happen uh, yet. Um, there's certainly lots of things we would like to do. We're in a growth position. We're in, the, we're in the time in our development where this is the biggest growth spurt we've had since we started. And so it's, you know, just like really ironic that this would happen at a time when there's a global pandemic and everyone's losing their jobs <laughs> and cutting back on giving so um, so that's a, that's scary but um, you know we're we like to take the longer view and just think you know it's gonna be a bumpy year or two and we're gonna come out of it and be able to do what we want to do right Julio or Jamie do you have any things specifically that you want to talk about regarding th things that you weren't able to implement um, because you had to shift gears or because you had funding you know deficit um we wanted to implement a third fundraising event which was like a uh, you know an annual luncheon if you will and really create a platform from the agency that continues what we did with a uh, 125th anniversary gala um in many ways our agency hasn't had that one moment where we can connect with influencers um and, and raise some money along the way to, to sort of uh get our message out there and, and have a convening moment um, in lieu of that, um, what we are doing is we are launching, as, as I mentioned before, a, a virtual major gift campaign um, focused on, uh, it's a continuation of COVID-19 support and we're calling it uh, the Little Scholars Fund. And essentially um, what we understand and there's approximately um, between about 250 families who are just shy about $1,000 a year to cover their copay. We're talking about families who are um, two to three times the pop, the federal poverty level. And we're, what we're basically doing is we're reaching out to folks, kind of uh, providing some context on, the, on, on their situation and enlisting um, donors to help underwrite or, or, or sponsor um, students uh, in our early ed program. So we're at the start of it. Um, we just launched, we have about uh, 20,000 uh, pledged towards it. We just started a few weeks ago. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking to line up a, a, a few different um, gatherings and have a launch uh, come late October, early November um, with board members and, and report out and, and keep raising funds. So, so um, that's probably what we put on hold, but we decided to pivot and really focus on virtual major gift fundraising um, in, in, you know, in, in this moment in time. Thanks. Jamie, do you have any, I saw you want to yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things that we've put on hold. Um, one of them is we've been running for the past couple of years a really great event in um, September that is a game day event. And the real, I mean, it's just fun, but it also brings together um, the right people in the space, which we don't always happen at events. And now there's no way to, to do that. And we've decided that um, not to do anything virtually. So it's been a lot of work to try to connect with the people who typically come um to keep them informed of what we're doing but we also had other plans you know uh, we should have been launching a rebrand of our organization in june um now that is it was on hold now we're slowly getting back into that space um i won't know for at least another month whether we have the funding to redo our website um which had all been that was all budgeted for and had been set aside um and we also were hoping to do an expansion of our adult day program and had been looking at ways um, actually to use part of our office space as a second location and a various other kind of components. And right now with so much uncertainty with state funding, 
um, in state reimbursements, plus um, difficulty of actually even getting people back into the program, that is um, completely on hold. So you know, most of it's programmatic, and I'm sure if our program directors who are sitting here, they could tell you huge lists of things that we have put on hold um, or, or shifted how we're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. It's 1027, Erica. <laughs> I know. We are, we are here. Thank you guys all so much to all of our attendees, but especially to our phenomenal panelists for your time and for sharing your insight with everyone today. Applaud. We really appreciate you. Um, thank you to the NIU Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies for providing the opportunity for Evolve Giving Group to partner with you. We are so happy to be here today. And we would like to offer complimentary coaching to everyone on this call. If anyone is interested, um, I think Jamie put in the uh, chat box a link to sign up, especially now during this tough time. We are so happy to help the sector that we love and serve. And I want to also just send one last reminder that the recording is going to be shared, slides and bios and emails of the panelists will be shared as well in case you have any questions to direct towards them. And if you want to contact myself or Jamie, here are our emails. We'd be happy to connect with you, answer any questions. But again, thank you and keep doing the great work that you are doing. It is so needed now more than ever before. Uh, Dr. Chapman, do you have anything else to add as we close today's webinar? Yeah, just echo, echo Erica and Jamie's thank yous to our panelists and, and everyone who joined us this morning. You can watch for an email from me. All of our upcoming events are on our Eventbrite page. So if you're interested in upcoming events, please sign up. And we're going to have Erica and Jamie back in the spring um, to kind of give us an update in a few months. How are we doing um, as we get through this next cycle of the pandemic? So thank you, everyone, for coming and watch for that email. Bye. Have, have a, a great day. day. Thank you. Take care.